Hello world, it's Craig. I was browsing on eBay the other day and this board jumped up at me to catch my attention. And I have not seen this particular bus for decades. And I'm hoping that somebody has documentation on this bus or maybe even this particular card. So this is an 885 based single board computer for the C44 bus. On set here, you can see their name on set is the manufacturer. And at that time they were back in Massachusetts. I was never really into this bus. I just know about it from a colleague who was doing some field work at the time, and I helped him evaluate some different embedded computer systems. And I, I was only peripherally involved, so I didn't get into the details of the, the actual bus structure. And for that matter, I'm not sure what bus they finally used for their projects. But the C44 bus was ingeniously named for the 44 finger connector. So there's 22 on each side, 0.156 pitch. And in a bit, I'll mention the identifying marks to help you identify this bus when you come across something that looks similar. But before that, let's talk about what makes this unique enough to be worth your consideration. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time searching, but I did try to get online and, and find out something about this bus, you know, to fill in the details of what I remembered. But unfortunately, searching for C44 bus, you know, just return crap results. C44 is just a common term. Onset C44 wasn't any better. It was just as useless. And I didn't come up with any good search terms to get good technical information, you know, particularly like a schematic or a user's manual for this thing. So C44 was pretty much a contemporary of the STD bus. It was maybe a little bit later, but it, it was a contemporary, but it was not a competitor, really kind of in any sense of the term. And I'll get to that in a minute. It was a published bus, but I think only adopted by a few manufacturers. There was Onset who, as I remember, created the bus. There was another company in Utah, and there may have been one or two others, but none that, that come to mind. And maybe somebody knows of others that supported this C44 bus. And at the time we evaluated the bus, there was an extremely small pool of cards available, six or eight, you know, maybe a dozen cards, but there was nothing like the dozens and dozens and dozens of cards that were available for STD at the time. But then their target application for the C44 wasn't the same as the industrial, you know, laboratory plug in the wall applications that was the target market for STD. So unlike STD, this was very much a niche application bus. It was targeting battery powered operation applications with the option to go into a very low power, you know, like milliwatts during a hibernation state. So with the C44, Onset was marketing to mostly remote sensing, subsea, geologic, borehole, oil field, space, that sort of thing. Now, I don't know if Onset originally designed this bus for the AD85, but I remember that the bus signals seemed to be a lot like the 8085 data sheet. It had multiplex address and data with the address latch and able, the ALE signal. And at the time I was very much into the 8085, so that stuck with me that you know this was essentially an 8085 bus. Now this is a CMOS 8085A. I'm not sure if Onset made other CPU cards besides the 8085, but this did have expanded addressing, you know, maybe uh, 20 bits or so. So I think that was used more like in memory paging rather than direct memory access, but perhaps they did use processors that had a native 20 bit addressing because this did have larger addressing on the bus. As I mentioned, it was targeting remote solar, you know, battery generator type of application. So it had an extremely wide range input for the voltage. And when I say wide range, it was from you know, a few volts above the bus operating voltage, which, uh, you know, was probably five volts on this, up to a float voltage of a 12 volt battery. So, you know, 15 volts. But what I do remember is that this bus could be just directly connected to a battery on an engine, this regular start battery. And after 30 years or so, it's funny that that's the thing that sticks most in my mind is that this system could be powered directly off an engine's 12 volt battery. And it, it still seems pretty impressive, but that fact must have made quite an impression at the time because that was one of the first things that came to mind when I, when I saw this. And the way they did this was, well, it was specifically designed for battery operation. So power was handled in a unique way on this bus. The CPU board 
was connected to the rough power source. You know, the battery or the whatever have you, solar panels with the battery or a, a genset. And the board had a little butt converter to drop the supply voltage down to the board voltage, the 5 volts for the board. And over here that looks like a, a battery or a speaker or something, this is actually a big choke for that buck converter, and here's the controller for it right here. So all the cards, the rest of the cards in the system didn't have to have their own buck converter because the CPU put that regulated plus 5 back out onto the bus, onto the back plane, to operate all the other cards in the system. And the converter didn't need to be that large since these were only small systems where STD could easily have a dozen cards. These C44 systems may only have a handful of cards in the system. You know, maybe a memory card and whatever data I.O. there were. Three or four cards were probably fairly typical. You know, maybe six cards were tops. You know, it was focused on remote location data acquisition. So whatever data you took, it had to be saved, you know, to RAM. I suppose, you know, by the mid-80s, they could have been using, you know, double EEPROMs or some other non-volatile 5-volt programmable uh, memory. Anyway, since the CPU was in charge of the power, it could reduce the power on the bus and put all of the other cards into a hibernation mode. And so one of these signals down here is a hibernate signal. And once it's asserted and everything's in the low power hibernate mode, the CPU buck converter would then drop the output power to the rest of the bus from five, from five volts down to whatever an idle voltage was, you know, two and a half, three volts, just to keep the RAM going. And you can see this has a little pot here. I'm gonna put this up on, so maybe we can see a little bit better. This has a little pot right down here. And I imagine that was maybe for setting the, uh, the little idle voltage. Now, somehow, there is a way to get out of that hibernate, and I don't remember if it could be done with just an interrupt to the processor, or if there was a specific signal, uh, you know, that would come from an external source, or you know, maybe this has a I don't didn't see one, but you know, a real-time clock or something uh, to to bring this out of that hibernate, bring this voltage back up to five volts, and so all of the other cards then could operate normally. So maybe somebody watching this knows the details, or better yet, has some documentation on the C44 bus. And as I mentioned, I wasn't into C44 at the time, so I didn't keep any documentation. In fact, I don't think I'm, I must have not ever had any documentation since it's not like me to throw uh, documentation away. Okay, what else do I know about this, or at least what do I think I know about this? It'll help you spot them if you come across them. You know, they're a fairly tiny board. They're only about four and a half inches wide. Fingers to top is about four and three quarter inches, not counting this header up here at the top. And you can see on this one, the traces were laid down by hand. So probably a vinyl rub down. So the boards were designed after ink on vellum, but before a computer layout. Fortunately, you can see there's some silk screen up here. And so we know what these chips are. This is a 2764. So this is our EEPROM and this top one by the connector. And this is a 5565, which is uh, Toshiba 8 kilobytes of RAM. So this is a fairly you know, capable board. The 2764 came out in 81, so this was designed you know, after that, or at least uh, in concert with that. There were CAD schematic capture and board layout programs in the early 80s. But they were fairly rare for a few more years. I think I got my first circuit board CAD in 85, maybe 86, maybe 87. And by then, circuit board CAD systems were reasonably affordable. So it's kind of surprising that this is a hand uh, vinyl rub down. And I suspect there is a date code on the back of this. It looks like 5 of 89. So if that is the date code, I can't be sure. But the chip dates are mostly 87 and 88, it seems. So that's, that fits into the time frame uh, for when this was made. But I don't know when it was laid out, of course. So identifying marks. The card's got uh, typical ejectors here at the top. I only remember it having one ejector, but this one's got two. So that's probably not a very good uh, uh, determining thing if you're trying to identify these. It does have one fairly unique identifying feature. If you look down here at the bottom, right over here in this corner, and right over here by this choke in that corner, you can see these two little holes. Now, 
These were for retainers in the card cage. So in the back plane, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd plug this into the back plane, and then you would put a card, a retainer card in, or a retainer rod in, and it would capture all of these little holes, and that would keep this thing from vibrating loose. So, you know, you'd shish kebab all of these cards, and the idea was to make sure that these weren't coming out until you asked them to, because, you know, after all, you don't want this thing coming loose if you're going to drop it down a pipe or put it into the ocean floor, or, you know, even worse, you know, these things were, were going in the space shuttle. And you don't want this vibrating loose. So it did have these retainer cards. As I mentioned, the bus fingers, you know, they really look short and stubby. They're uh, uh, on point one five six centers. There's 22 on each side. They really look archaic, uh, just the form factor on them. I don't think all of the cards were keyed, so if you're looking for one of these, if you see a picture of it and it doesn't have the key, don't let that, that uh, be a deciding factor. I don't think they all were keyed. Obviously, it's a good idea because it is symmetric. So if you look at this notch and that notch, it's the same. So this could be accidentally put in backwards. And so the keying was obviously a good idea to keep it from being put in backwards, but I don't think they originally had keys. And if you do get a picture of it and you can see uh, the, the traces, the first two fingers on each end are power and ground. And they're the same on each side. So when identifying the board, there'll be a, a power via near the top of each of these two fingers. The leftmost finger, top and bottom. So this little finger over here on the top and the same one on the bottom are the power input. So this would have been the rough power input, either you know from the, the 8 to 15 volt or 8 to 16 volt power input right into the buck converter. And probably only the CPU card will have that connected to anything. Then on the right hand side, you can see this is the power output. So it would come through the buck converter, it would of course service this card, and then the finger on the right hand side, front and back, is the regulated 5 volts or you know 3 volts or 2.5 volts whatever would be in the hibernate mode going to the rest of the cards the second finger in top and bottom is the ground and so you can see on this one for example it's easily this ground comes up and it, it serves the bottom left pin of this logic chip and then it goes around the board and underneath this choke over here and presumably comes back out on the second finger over here so if you get a good look at the card these end fingers should be fairly wide traces for power and they should have a little power sized via directly above that trace where it, it connects the front finger to the back finger. Since this is a processor card, it's got the, the little buck power converter and I think any processor card has to have the buck power converter uh, to be compliant with the C44. But if you're looking at this and you see a card that is one of the other cards, a data acquisition or a memory card, it probably most certainly will not have this uh, buck converter unless I suppose it used a lot of power and so it had to had to uh, uh, you know if it was out of out of the specs of what could be provided by this card maybe it did have a little buck converter on it but I think it was probably fairly unlikely for another card to have a buck converter okay unfortunately I can't really think of any other identifying marks uh, so that when you see this you can say ah oh, that's a c44 card I think I want to own one of those uh, you know, even the two holes in the bottom isn't a dead giveaway since other cards had retainers uh, built into them. So if anybody knows anything about these boards or the C44 bus, you know, please chime in with any useful information because I think it's going to be hard to find information because it just wasn't that common of a bus and it was a very niche application and they're just such common terms, it's hard to search the internet for for. Uh, for information on this bus. So for this particular card, as I mentioned, it's got the, this is a CMOS version of the 8085, and it has our old friend, the 81C55. So this has a little bit of RAM and a counter timer and programmable IO on this 8155. So this is the IO here that's at the top. All the logic chips seem to be from the HC family. So thankfully, you know, if there's something wrong with this board, there's nothing really exotic on it. And the silk screen is under these two chips, so presumably uh, it's under all of them, but all the rest of them are soldered, and you can see that it's still got some of the conformal coating on it, or it still has all of the conformal coating on it. It doesn't look like anything, any work has ever been done 
on this board. So hopefully there's nothing wrong with this because I don't like having to strip off that uh, conformal coating. So with 8K of EEPROM and 8K of, of RAM, uh, 8155, you know, this, this has a lot of similar capabilities to, uh, you know, my little STD85 board. This is a 8085, 8155, except we can have on the later versions, you know, much bigger RAM and, and ROM. And it's got a serial port, but you know, it's fairly comparable. Same type of capabilities, uh, same class as what my SBC85 is. I've already got projects all over my bench, so I'm gonna hold off doing much with this until later. And you know, maybe somebody will show up with some documentation and help me figure out what these jumpers on, but it should only take, you know, 10 minutes or so to, to slap a, a little serial port on this and at least find where the RAM is. And maybe I'll do that in the next video. Just fire this up to see if it works. But I wanted to, you know, this just showed up in the mail. I wanted to get the information out there and, you know, let it ruminate it a little. Maybe somebody is a C44 expert, used this back in the day, and they can save me some work of trying to figure things out. You know, somebody somewhere must have a user's manual for this thing. If you come across what you think is a C44 board and you're not interested in getting it, you know, please send me the information because I would like to get a, you know, a little C44 system running with a CPU card and a couple of memory cards and a couple of I.O. cards just to, just to see it going. Uh, what else is there? Onset is still actually in business, I think. I think they still do data loggers. So this kind of, maybe this put them on the map, but I think Onset still does data loggers. Uh, but I imagine anybody that is there now is uh, that you know doesn't know anything about this board. I suppose it's worth a phone call to see if they even want to be helpful. But whenever I call a company looking for information on a product from 40 years ago, you know, it generally doesn't end with me receiving any useful information. Okay, well that is it for this video. As I said, I may do a couple of quick tests on this board uh, in the next video, just to at least find the RAM. So, you know, once you find the RAM, then I can start writing code for it and it gets a lot easier to to do diagnostics and figure out where things are uh, once I can, I can download code to this easily. It just speeds things up. All right, that's it for this video. I appreciate you watching. Again, if you have any information on C44, uh, let us know. I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.